This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwar arcade parts. Hello and welcome to Desert Island Diskettes, the very first episode in our new podcast format show. I'm Neil from the YouTube channel Retro Man Cave. And I'm Andrew from the Back Office Show. And in each episode we'll be joined by a special guest who we're going to cast away on a desert island for reasons. I'm not sure we need a reason, but we're not completely (laughs) heartless. Our castaway takes with them eight pieces of music to keep them company, with the only caveat being that it has to be a computer-based composition. That's right, it can be music from games of any era, from consoles or computers. The demo scene crack throws anything, really, that's uh, in that ballpark, and it acts as a vehicle for our guests to tell us their life story in retro through the music. That sounds good to me, so why don't we meet our guests for this episode? So Ollie, thank you so much for being our very first retro castaway. Uh, Andrew and I both came across you on YouTube, so why don't you explain to us what kind of content you make and, and what you share on your channel, please? Sure. So I uh, I I'm, I make video game music essentially. Uh, I cover video game music on YouTube, uh, like so many people. But um, uh, I do a lot of acoustic uh, covers, really. Um, so it's mostly based around things like the banjo, hence the name Banjo Guy Ali. Um, uh, also use the mandolin. I use a, a variety of different acoustic instruments. Uh, I suppose it comes from my background of being a traditional uh, Celtic musician. So I have some proficiency in all these instruments. So that, that's what I try to do. And uh, I've been doing that now since 2014, I think. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's going slowly, but it's going well. So I'm, I'm happy with it. Um, and I still enjoy what I do, which is great after, what, three, four years now. <laughs> so Oli, how, how did you find the process of narrowing down your selection to just eight tracks? Um, <laughs> I found it very difficult, um, actually. But um, I don't know, I try to, uh, I try to pick, I try to pick songs that either had an influence on, on, who I became as a musician or how I started appreciating video games more. I mean, there's a reason why I do video game music on YouTube. It's because I, 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 I do have an appreciation for music in general, obviously, but also for the, the, the work that those composers do and have done in the past and uh, also try to bring some legitimacy to maybe some of the songs that you didn't... Uh, which people might might not know, you know, or, or have been forgotten, like stuff like Nightmare, like Nemesis 2, which was only a, uh, an MSX uh, release. Like, there's a few like that. So, um, yeah, it was it was just what affected me most at the time. Yeah, well, there were certainly some tracks on the list which I haven't heard of before, so I, I enjoyed listening to them, and hopefully the listeners will too. So, um, on that note, why don't you introduce us to the first song that you've chosen and let us know a little bit about why you've chosen it. So, where do I start? My my father worked for Philips uh, in France. I grew up, I was born and raised in France and grew up in France. And uh, my father worked for Philips. So we had the video pack and then the MSX very, very early uh, when Philips started producing, uh, you know, making these. So I had a lot of games. Uh, I had a ton of games, um, you know, acquired through uh, various channels, but <laughs> I had access to a lot of games. Uh, and most of the early games on the MSX, and it's probably the case in, you know, a lot of stuff from the Spectrum era and, or C60+, Plus, but were inherited from the arcades, really. They were static, one-screen type of games, very much like just a full-color game and watch type of stuff. But... Um, it, they were very simple games, and so was the music and, and graphics for a lot of these games. And Nightmare was the first one where I, I realized, oh my god, this is an art form. Video games is an art form. Uh, I was already interested in music and you know doodling, but however interested you can be at 10 or 12. Or, but uh, that's when I realized, oh my god, these are just full-blown just pr- productions and... It was the first time that I heard the music that had a proper composition uh, outside, just a little nice ditty that you know just repeats itself. But um, I, it was the first time I understood the uh, the importance of uh, having a solid three-part sort of uh, elements to a tune, and it just it introduced a lot of stuff for me in music and in gaming uh, as well. That's when I realized 
you can actually have an epic piece in a video game, uh, uh, you know, fully composed track, and uh, and it works, and it, it 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 actually enhances the game because it's such an iconic tune for the MSX, probably even more so than any other track on the MSX. Ollie, you've you've chosen more than one MSX track today, and uh, that was clearly the first computer you, you owned. But uh, did, did you have that computer for a while? The MSX, yes. Um, well, I, I still have it, but um, I uh, yeah, that was my very very first computer. So, like I said, my 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 father worked for Philips. And uh, the first machine we had was the video pack, which was the uh, Magnavox Odyssey in the US. And Philips um, made the video pack for Europe. And I had that very, very early. In fact, I had a few prototypes of the video pack uh, that my father brought home. So we had just the breadboard and uh, we'd, we'd have little cartridges without the case, again, so just the, uh, the, the cart and the chip uh, that we'd put in the slot. So we played with that for probably over a year. And the f- I think the first week we didn't have a joystick either. So what we had was just the uh, cable and we'd put all the, the wires in our, uh, in our, um, between our fingers like that and just connect them manually. Um, wasn't safe, but I don't think it was too dangerous either. I think it's only five volts uh, running in there, but uh, and we can really control anything. But that's all we had to play with. So uh, we did that for a while, and then we got a joystick. Um, Timeline is a bit fuzzy now, but uh, we got a, obviously an MSX after that. And uh, I'd never seen a, f- a home computer, so my only experience of computers was just from films, and and uh, at the time films were bringing out you know stories of sentient computers and that kind of stuff so i remember i remember what the first time i saw the msx my father was in his room or office and uh, he had this machine just laying down and uh, I, as i walked in he had or he called me over he said have a look at this as i walked in he had typed print hello ollie or something like that and uh, so he just displayed hello ollie on this sc- on the on the screen now again, I would have been nine, ten, and uh, and I just froze, and I was like, "Oh my God, that thing is talking to me!" So I just went, "Oh, hi!" <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes, that, that that was my first <laughs> first uh, experience with the MSX. So we had that for probably a year, and then the MSX2 came out, or the f- prototypes of the MSX2 came out, uh, and I kept the MSX. I I really don't know, but many many years I still played with the MSX until I got an Amiga. Uh, well into the lifespan of the, uh, the Amiga. So. Well, we'll come on to the Amiga a bit later because you have chosen a track from the Amiga. Uh, but the MSX, certainly here in the UK, was quite a rare beast. Uh, was it something that your friends had or were you the only one to have an MSX at the time? So my, so my parents were separated, so whenever I went with my uh, mom, which I was further in the south of France, um, nobody had even heard of the MSX. It was only in the north of France that you know, you'd find more MSX. And I think it's because of the proximity with uh, Holland, obviously, the, that's where the, uh, the Philips brand came from. So um, people in North France were probably more aware of the MSX. And I had a few friends uh, that were where my dad lived um, that, that had an MSX or at least knew about it. But it was still a rarity. Like, there wasn't that many, um, that many people that, that, that knew even it existed. Uh, yeah, it's it's a f- it's a funny system. I'm I'm kind of glad that it was a rarity, and that that and that I got to experience this experience it firsthand at the time because uh, I kind of feel privileged now. <laughs> and uh, Ollie, um, bearing in mind though we're we're not musicians, how would you go about arranging a video game track to cover on a banjo? So well, it's it's really a matter of just separating all the all the the elements of the track so nowadays it's very easy you know you find the sheet music or the uh, midi file or the original file which you can transpose into midi as well so it's it's not that big a deal it just requires a bit of tidying up and uh, and uh, just you know time it's it's tedious more than complicated really 
Um, so taking um, Nightmare in particular, did that did that track lend itself well to being covered? You know, is there such a thing as an easy track to cover? No, <laughs> no, there isn't. Um, and my, my wife laughs at the time because every time I finish a cover, I go, oh, that was probably the hardest one I've worked on. She, yeah, 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 you said that the last time as well. Um, no, there's nothing easy about it, but... Um, I, I, I'll, uh, I, I have to admit, in preparation for this, I, I fired up my favourite track, which is F-Zero on the Super Nintendo, and I sat there with a the mic going, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and then I, then I went back in audacity, went, ba, 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 you know, and I played it back, and it sounded terrible. <laughs> Well, I, I'm cheating because I've been playing music for 30 years now. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So it, it, once you've isolated all, all the tracks, obviously you need to to learn it and and play it. Uh, that's actually the easiest part for me because, like I said, I've you know, I've 30 years of playing music and uh, and and Irish music as well, um, which is quite fast and quite uh, intricate. Uh, so yeah but bar a few really 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 tricky tracks that i don't want to go near um the, the playing the learning itself and playing is 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 quite easy and i can't read music so i do everything by ear um or midi so, so the, it's it's once you've recorded everything so i record usually i record just a, a draft um a sort of unclean draft just to set everything and then once i'm happy with the composition or the arrangement I re-record everything again cleaner and tighter you know tighter and then I go through that process a few times until I'm happy with the uh, the full arrangement and then I go back to the the track and just cut a part here or cut a part there just to have a, a proper intro or an outro or a middle section and that kind of stuff. Well as a man who recently bought uh, an electric piano hearing that you can't read music uh, gives me some hope. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not a requirement reading music. I always say you, you could you could speak and talk long before you could read and write. So, it's the same with music. Um, why don't you go ahead and introduce us to the to the second song on your list, then, Ollie? So, I believe the second song was the uh, level four track from Nemesis Two, um, and uh, Nemesis Two is essentially uh, Gradius. Um, Gradius 2 on the on the MSX. Now Gradius 2 was only released on the MSX and I believe the uh, what is it called the, the PC 98 or 8800 or something like that. Another Japanese uh, home computer. Um, and it was just a special version uh, released for those platforms. So it, it doesn't actually exist on the NES or even arcade. And it was the first game that used the SCC soundtrack that expands on the uh, three. Uh, channel PSG of the MSX and actually adds an extra four channels. So there were full um, seven channels. Um, of I think there's also a noise channel. So essentially, you have eight tracks now on your MSX. The MSX was interesting because, like that, you could actually have cartridges that added a new music format. Uh, so there's about five or six different music formats for the MSX, depending on what chip they used, um, which is really, really cool. So that was the first one that actually used that chip. And um, it's hard to describe to new gamers, um, but how starved for content we were uh, back then. It, it wasn't a case of you could check something on the internet or you could buy a magazine uh, somewhere because there was no shops that had uh, uh, magazines or those magazines weren't you know, on stock in that shop. And then whatever content you had was, uh, you had it for a few months until the next issue of the magazine you could buy if you were lucky, or you had an arcade hall somewhere near you and you could check uh, check out those games. And I was always envious, obviously, of arcade games, how beautiful they looked and and how the music was just so grandiose on those uh, on those machines, especially for shooters. And uh, and Nemesis 2 was the first uh, time, first I heard that SCC chip, I didn't know that was possible, it was quite a revelation, I was like, oh my god, you can actually have full orchestrated pieces on the, uh, on, on the MSX. And then the music was sort of, in my head, at least on par with what you'd find in the arcades. Uh, and that track, especially when I heard it the first time, there's so many echoey sections in that track, and, and the arrangement just... It, it, it brought it to an, the next level of what I could expect from my machine, and, uh, and uh, it got me interested as well into looking 
into ICs and chips and you know that kind of stuff. Um, because my, my father used to be a, a, he used to do repairs and prototyping for Philips, so uh, he was trying to teach me some of the, the stuff that he was doing, and I had no interest until I realized that uh, in that little thing was an extra chip, and uh, and uh, maybe if I paid more in, you know attention to what my dad was trying to tell me, I'd understand more about that. So that's when I kind of uh, tried to get an interest in uh, uh, electronics. Um, I was probably too young really to start uh, there, so I didn't quite know what I was doing, but it was cool to dabble. another shoot 'em up game is that a genre you particularly like yeah actually no but well i don't know i don't think i have a genre i, I like especially but uh, i like these yeah um i like these i'm, I'm very bad at shoot 'em ups actually i i uh, i think i cleared nightmare once but uh, nemesis 2 i never never actually cleared it and i i tried i tried so hard but that game was actually cool and there's a there was a warp zones as well that if you hit a certain pixel at a certain time, it was so hard to get. You could actually get into warp zone to get special uh, bonuses and, and weapons. Um, the first time I discovered that was just, oh my god! I mean, this is uh, this, yeah. Um, it was a cool game, though. Nemesis. I, I very much enjoyed that series. Actually, the Gradius series. So, so Gradius was a uh, you know an arcade, arcade port. So, and you did mention earlier that you you were envious of the graphics and sound of the arcade games. Did you spend much time in arcade halls yourself? Um, probably more time than I should have for an underage uh, uh, teenager. <laughs> um, I'm still surprised I, I managed to spend that much time in arcade halls because um, I think the, the the age was 16, and I, I was definitely going there when I was 11 or 12. So. Um, I, I just wanted. I, I didn't have any money, so I just wanted to watch people play. You know, I didn't actually play much myself. But uh, and every time, I, every time I'd hear an arcade, because you could hear the sounds from you know hundreds of meters away. Like every time I heard uh, the sound of an arcade, I'd I'd, uh, I'd I'd try to find out where it was. So uh, I snuck out of the house a few times just to uh, to see where that arcade was, and I'd spend hours there just watching people play. They were actually quite safe, despite what everybody was saying. And which ones would you choose specifically to watch over someone's shoulder? To watch um, anything, really, anything that anyone was playing. <laughs> Try to watch. Uh, Arkanoid and Pac-Man were were obviously yeah, big hitters with uh, with me. Um, Galaga, I love the the sound. I have all these machines now at home as well. Um, so yeah, and uh, uh, Outrun, but that's that came out, you know. Uh, a good bit after that but um yeah the, i'm the, I, it's more eight bit era for me uh. just sticking with the msx for now um my pet peeve with that machine is that it's often the victim of quite shoddy zx spectrum ports and they didn't didn't bother to tighten up the the color attributes from the spectrum so it was a perfectly capable machine graphically but the ports just made it look like a zx spectrum and that really bugged me, especially because at the time I had an Amstrad CPC 464, which was also the victim of, of bad ports. So looking back at the MSX, how do you think it compared to the more popular 8-bits? And do you think it deserved to be more popular and to be remembered more fondly? Yeah, that's a good question. How, If I'm, if I'm objective about it, I don't think it, it, it had a chance to compete um, at the time it came out. Uh, because 16-bit computer were starting to appear. It sort of was the grandfather of the modern PC. I think that it was the, more or less the, uh, the, the idea, you know, to have a, a standardized f um, platform. Uh, it didn't quite work like that, but um, uh, he, I don't think, I don't even against stuff like the C64 or the Amstrad, I don't think it did have much of a chance. The, uh, the, the games on, on those machines were they were better visually. I mean, the, the CPC had an amazing color palette, a uh, very similar sound chip, 
and then uh, and then the uh, the C64 just had all that just huge momentum of of uh, coders and the demo scene and and just real talent on those platforms that the MSX couldn't compete with. What it had though was the support of companies like Konami, uh, like you know Sony, like HAL, so uh, and Taito as well. So a lot of these uh, arcade games could have been ported and ported really really well, and I'm surprised they weren't ported better than they were. Um, but Konami certainly did know the MSX well and, and did some very, very nice and tight uh, games that actually still to this day a lot of people are wondering exactly uh, how they managed to you know, make that scrolling so good or you know, the, those music work with the timing of the... Uh, the <laughs> it, 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 they were really, really well-crafted uh, crafted games. Um, could it compete with other platforms? I, I, I don't think so. So Oli, did you did you ever use your MSX to make music? I did, yeah. That was the my first introduction to music was the MSX. My uh, so my dad could do some coding as well, and um, uh, so he showed me how to you know just to you know, print hello and that kind of stuff. And then I picked up the uh, the uh, MSX Basic manual, uh, which was actually a very very nice and powerful Basic, and uh, started making little just making sounds come out of the uh, the monitor really. Um, I didn't know anything about music, but uh, it kind of it brought me to the you know the IBC system for music notation, and then I uh, started understanding what a uh, what a, an octave was, and then how you could get actually pleasant harmonies um, by putting two notes together. That and then w- which third note to put it after that. So it sort of brought me, and then I got interested into music, uh, into music as a as an art form. Um, probably years after with with the Amiga, but the MSX was certainly my introduction to making noise. <laughs> it's probably the best way to put it. So Oli, would you like to uh, tell us about your next choice of uh, tune? So again, we're staying with an MSX uh, track, uh, although this one has been on, the, on a few other platforms as well, but it's the uh, Vampire Killer uh, theme from the MSX game Vampire Killer, uh, also known as uh, Castlevania for uh, for the uh, NES and uh, every other platform ever invented. It's just, it's. I mean, I'm, I'm going to run out of superlatives trying to describe the uh, Castlevania music, but it's, it's. They, they are masterpieces of, uh, of composition. I, I was first introduced to this game, obviously on the MSX, years and years before the uh, NES version came out. So. Within a month, I think the uh, I think it was the Famicom Disk System had uh, Castlevania, and then uh, yeah, it was released on the MSX about a month, roughly a month after. Uh, and the way Konami worked those days, they had two separate teams working on the different platforms, and they would share assets, so obviously music and graphics and sprites. Um, but the, the direction they had a general direction where the game was was going to go, but uh, you know the, it was up to the separate teams then to. Uh, to find a way that worked best for the platform. So the, the MSX2 t- didn't have a scrolling register, not horizontal anyway. So uh, they couldn't do a Castlevania the way it was done on the NES. So they, they went for a screen by screen. So um, they're just st- static screens. And because of that, the game took a different aspect. It was more an exploration game than it was a, just a, a linear platformer. And for me, it sort of ch- affected or changed the way I perceived the music. It was suddenly more because you were stuck in that big mansion uh, and uh, and you were stuck with that music for a while, and you had to backtrack and get get a key to open a door, etc., etc. Et it wasn't just a you know right to left. It just those music felt a lot more claustrophobic, and it was the first time I believe that. I remember going to bed, falling asleep with that music in my head and actually just being scared. I genuinely just going, oh, that's actually me stuck in that mention, not <laughs> not a, a, an 8 by block of pixels or a 16 by 16 block of pixels, but it's actually me. And then when I woke up again, that music was still in, in my head and I was like, oh my God, what's going on? That was the first time that I experienced a game in that way that was actually just so so vivid and uh, and visceral. Uh, and that track certainly, uh, for me, is the, uh, the the most iconic track of the, uh, the Castlevania series for, for a lot of people, obviously.
remember playing that on the NES, and it was a fantastic game, right? And then, it, then there was a lot, a bit of a delay. And then when I got the Super Nintendo, and do you remember it had that sound chip in there by Sony? It was just amazing. And even now, if you just fire up the Super Nintendo or even an emulator, that music is just perfect. There's something perfect. Yeah, about definitely. That. So yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I hundred percent agree. It's um. Yeah, it's 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 fun. And I got this game by accident as well. It's just uh, we we uh, were passing the shop with my dad, and I think he was looking for a present or something like that. So he, he actually walked in and came out with that because that was just on the shelves. And I remember, I remember seeing an arcade machine. I was going. My my mother sent me to. Um, my mother used to send me to England a lot. So I, I'd go to Cornwall to friends she had over there, so I could learn English. And. Um, I remember in the ferry port in Roscoff uh, seeing a, a, one of those Nintendo Duel thing or whatever it was called, but it was running Castlevania. Oh, was it the Play Choice mission? Play Choice, that's right, yes. And uh, and um, I should know that. And, <laughs> and it was running Castlevania, and it was the first time I saw Castlevania, actually Castlevania. But, and, so my first reaction was like, what if they've done vampire killer for the nintendo that's what i called it at the time and uh, i was uh, i was appalled at how horrible it looked because all the colors were wrong and the sprite colors were wrong and the music was certainly wrong <laughs> the name was wrong most importantly and the name was wrong yeah castlevania what is this it actually makes more sense doesn't it vampire killer it does what it says on the uh, team exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that um, so that's obviously I think the very early Castlevania game, if not the first, yeah. And you've mentioned the NES, but do you have a love for the the series continuing on from that? Um, yes, yes, and no. I actually never paid uh, much attention then to the games until much, much later when the emulation started to uh, appear. Well, for me, it was early 2000s anyway, uh, where I, I discovered that there was a Castlevania 2. I didn't know that. And then there was a Castlevania 3. And there was a, actually a whole lot of uh, Castlevania to be played um, uh, on various platforms. So uh, I, I, uh, that's where I picked up the uh, interest in the series after that. And uh, obviously, musically for me, it was, uh, it was quite a revelation. Uh, but yeah, so much, much later. Um, I, I would have killed for a Castlevania 2 uh, on the MSX. I used to dream about this game because there's a, the level where you have doorways and you need to uh, cr crouch in the doorways and press up as well and it, it escapes, you know, you, you actually phase out and end up in another section of the level. Um, it's a very, very different level and uh, so it, it, it sort of acts like secret doors like you'd have in uh, Wonder Boy 3 for example but uh, um, so I used to dream then of secrets uh, within other levels that I discover and then wake up in the morning going oh no that was a dream it doesn't exist um, so anything Castlevania I would have loved at the time yeah let's just stay on the theme of dreams there for a moment because the only video game I've ever dreamt of was because I just played it too damn much and it was cannon fodder. And I don't know if you've ever <laughs> played cannon fodder. Yeah. There's a certain noise that the birds make as they fly across the screen. It's like, ah, ah. <laughs> and I would hear that in my sleep all night. <laughs> That's when I knew I'd played too much. You played too much. That was certainly, well, yeah. War has never been so much fun, has it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Ollie, you've got a series on your YouTube channel called Music for Games That Never Were. Have you ever released music for a real game, or is that an ambition of yours? Uh, well, yes and no. Um, so th those tracks were actually the remastered tracks of stuff I I've had done on the Amiga. So we had a small demo group uh, back then that actually never published anything because we weren't quite good enough, really. Um, and also we were in our tiny French village, just completely isolated. We couldn't drive anywhere. We couldn't go to any uh, conventions. Uh, actually, they weren't called conventions. They were called just demo parties or something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, ha I had done a lot of, uh, of music for those demos and little small games that we were just messing with, you know. I have a few more, yeah. I've been commissioned to do a few pieces for a couple of games that were not released and uh, I just need to clear that, that I can use the music for the channel. Um, 
And to answer the yes part of the question, uh, I've done a few covers actually for uh, a, a game that's coming out soon called Monster Boy, which is a, a sequel to the uh, Wonder Boy 3 series. It's done by uh, uh, Game Atelier. And uh, they've, uh, they've approached me back in early days of the channel, back in 2014, see if they could use my, uh, my music, my cover for one of their announcement videos. So I said, wow, oh, please, yeah, I have great and you wonder by game a big fan of the series and then uh, and then uh, they, uh, they said well if you want we you know if you have more uh, let us know like we'll do more announcements so i said well i haven't got more but i uh, i will have more so we started talking and uh for well first i got paid but <laughs> how how about we put you in the game in some fashion because uh, the plan was to use those covers for just for announcements and then uh, and then so essentially I can say it now because uh, I've released a, a gameplay footage of the uh, demo where it transpires but th there will be an NPC character with all those covers that you have to unlock uh, in the game sort of like Shovel Knight and uh, yeah looking looking forward to it I've, I've, done, I've finished the last few covers a while back so there's going to be like seven seven covers of mine so there won't be the main musics in the game but there'll be just extras unlockable extras so it's good well you mentioned wonder boy there which uh is perfect because that leads us into your next choice wonder boy 3 on the sega master system uh and this track is from is it from the monster village town or is that the name of the track uh i think it's the name of the track yeah yeah, yeah. from the MSX to the Sega Master System. Did you own or have access to one as a child? I had access to one. I didn't own one. Um, my, uh, my, my brother and I ended up having one, but he wasn't much of a gamer, so I was playing it. But my first access uh, to a Sega Master System was actually from a friend of mine who uh, obviously had one and uh, we, we ended up swapping. We used to do that a lot, so I, I got most of the home computers at some point in my house but we'd swap our machines you know for a couple of weeks so we could actually just play each other's game so I ended up with the Sega Master System and there was three games there was uh, Psycho Fox uh, Wonder Boy 3 and Is so pretty 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 cool game uh, straight away to have as first games for the Master System uh, but I played Monster Boy most it was such a such a, a, a really cool game so I, I think I think I had it for about three weeks first, uh, and then uh, we swept back, and my brother ended up, I think, the, the next Christmas with a, a master system that he never really played. It must have, it must have felt like quite a uh, quite a leap from the MSX to the master system. <laughs> it, it was, yeah, it was. Well, certainly graphically, it was just um, so full of colors, um, and then it had pretty decent parts of all those arcade games that I would uh, drool over in the, in the arcades so yeah I enjoyed the Master System I, I really really liked it um, although the, the, the PSG just whew <laughs> you, you tolerated the sound chip more than you enjoyed it really if, you, if I'm honest about it yeah but we've, we've certainly spoken about good 8-bit music I think certain composers in the 8-bit era were aware of how repetitive the music could get on these 8-bit titles um rob hubbard for example i know he made the international karate plus music a full 10 minutes long despite the limited yeah. space because he wanted to avoid that repetition for the player so what do you think really are the worst offenders in your mind uh, at games that are perhaps even ruined by the music so, uh, music is sort of super important for me in a game and i'll, I'll forgive a lot of stuff if there's decent music so a game like gods if i'm truly honest isn't a super enjoyable game to play i don't find it very enjoyable it's beautiful but i i, I never quite like it but the music is so <laughs> amazingly good i would just i would power it on just to get the music i see you've you covered um was it enter the wonderful that you yeah, covered yeah. on your channel yeah um 
but games that were ruined by the music I yeah I, I I'd have to think about that I'm not yeah I don't know a, a wealth of choices no doubt in the ZX Spectrum library for a contender for worst audio but uh moving on um we'll, we'll go back to Wonder Boy my first memory of Wonder Boy or at least the first one was in the arcades and I don't think I ever really got any further than the skateboard on on level one for my 10 pence piece and uh, as a result I never really followed the series much further so have you played through all of them or is three just a standout game for you yeah I did play it through all of them because um, uh, again on the master system although I did I, I was aware of uh, Monster uh, Wonder Boy uh, the first one uh, in the arcades and I, I did I did get to play that at the time I did, did enjoy it actually the music was super repetitive in that actually <laughs> the, 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 there's one that just uh, gets to you <laughs> but um yeah, it wasn't exactly an outstanding game, Wonder Boy, but it was just uh, it, it was it was just so colorful and and kind of there was something um, charming about it that uh, sort of attracted me. Um, and then I got to play M- uh, Wonder Boy Two on the Sega Master System, uh, and that was quite a different game already. Um, suddenly we had sort of an adventure. I wouldn't say RPG, but yeah, more of an adventure uh, game based game. And uh, and Wonder Boy Three was just an iteration of that, just picked up from where the the game uh, uh, left and uh, expanded on that. And it, it was the first time actually I, I've talked about it uh, with uh, with somebody else on a different podcast. But it was the f- the first time I saw a game referencing another game, aka Wonder Boy Two in that case, because when you start Wonder Boy Three. It's the last level of Wonder Boy 2, and uh, it was the first time I saw that. So it was just absolutely amazing uh, to uh, to see an, a game referencing another game. It was just unreal. Like we'd never seen anything like that. Because um, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, conventions that we use now in video games and or gameplay, uh, you know, they, they've been around for a while, but at the time they hadn't been invented. It was just a, an amazing world to discover. So when you see a game doing something new or uh, or doing something like that, it was, it, it was fantastic. Before you tell us what your next choice is, we're moving into a new decade and we're moving into 16 bits from 8 bits. And we took a look at the charts because this is a game from 1990. And we were just interested in what perhaps you kind of music you were listening to at this time. Perhaps not these songs that were in the charts. We're going to give you some examples of what was in the charts in 1990. So you've got... Um, MC Hammer, You Can't Touch This. <laughs> You've got Madonna's Vogue. You've got Love Shack by the B-52s. <laughs> You've got Ice Ice Baby. This was a good year, Ollie. This was a good year. You've got Pump Up the Jam. Oh, God. And you've got Groove is in the Heart by D-Light. Any of those take your fancy? <laughs> Put it this way, I'm, 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 I'm very aware of all these, uh, <laughs> these songs for uh, having heard them once or twice or maybe a hundred. But um, no, actually, they weren't my... I, I used to listen to a lot of um, uh, 80s, 90s metal. So uh, for me, 90s were early 90s, very much Guns N' Roses uh, years. A lot of... Uh, a lot of ACDC and Metallica, and before that it would have been Iron Maiden and uh, Scorpions. Yeah, in fact, if you look at your most popular tracks on your YouTube channel, I think the number one most watched cover that you do is Metallica. <laughs> yes. Closely followed by, I think it's Vampire Killer. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, not um, not pump up the jam then. No, not <laughs> pump up the jam. <laughs> So why don't you introduce your next song then uh, from the uh, from the computer side of things? So I believe the next song is from the game uh, Tarkin. I'm not sure that is it Tarkin. It's pronounced. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Is it Tarkin one or two? Uh, Tarkin one. The the first one is called uh, Shoot or Die. Where do I start? First, Chris Hulsbeck was just a a, a, a hero. Uh, f- f- I think he is for any Amiga owners. Anyway, that if, if there's one name that comes out of the, that era, it's, it's Chris Hulsbeck, at least on the Amiga. And uh, so I was aware of his stuff from the uh, C64 before, but it, uh, when I heard the uh, the soundtrack uh, for Turrican, that intro first is just so striking. It's so cinematic. It's straight out of, of an 80s movie. Um, you got the digitized voices and then uh, you get that that big track that is completely in your face and then something was not right I remember listening to it going hold on there's something not right here how is he getting all these tracks 
because uh, the Amiga only had eight tracks, and uh, and Chris uh, had written his own drivers that could actually handle a lot more than that by you know adding um, two tracks on the fly and, and uh, other bits like that. But uh, so it was, I didn't know how he'd done it at the time. I was just in complete awe, and it was just an aura of mystery around what he had done. Because again, there was nowhere for me to research uh, any of of, uh, of that. So. Uh, we just had to, you know, believe that it was indeed magic, and uh, and it was such an iconic track of the uh, the, the, the Amiga days, um, Tarkin, for for that reason and for the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an epic uh, story, musical story, um, and it was the first one I heard ever uh, on coming out of the computer. remember being your first impression of the Amiga? Um, I, I remember it very well. I was in a shop and my friend had bought an Amiga a few days before that and he told me you have to get one. So um, I, I went first to his place to check it out and I think I cannot remember what he was playing. I don't think he had any game. He was just playing the... Uh, no, he had Tetris on it. But he was... he. We, we just spent the whole afternoon just playing with the uh, Amiga Basic and uh, and watching that ball bounce. There was a demo that came with it, with a bouncing ball that would spin. So I think most Amiga owners have done that at some point, spent an afternoon just watching that. And then um, we played Tetris for the rest of the day. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't my, it wasn't what I would describe by, as my first impression though, because I still wasn't sure what the Amiga could do. I, I just knew it could do a lot of things. So I, I went to the shop just I had some pocket money that I had saved for a few years, and uh, and I think my mother had the rest, you know, the the other three thousand euros. But um, um, so we we got to the shop, and um, I said, uh, anyway, I started talking to the vendor, and I said, um, I I heard good things of the Amiga and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So she said, well, uh, I have one here set up, and she pulled out this demo disc and started the Amiga, and it was the demo for. Uh, Shadow of the Beast. But when that game just came on that little CRT screen, uh, you'd never seen anything like that. You'd never seen scrolling that smooth. Uh, you'd never seen sprites that well animated. You'd never seen those parallax, that parallax. You, you, it, it did so many things so well. And the music was so ridiculously evocative. That could actually have been in that list. There was a tie with Turrican. Yeah, um, the, um, the, the, the sound of the pipes on the Shadow of the Beast soundtrack is so oh, distinctive, isn't it? Yeah. It, it was just, uh, yeah. Actually, that should have been on the list. There you go. That's a nine-tune uh, nine list. But, um, yeah, it, it was... Uh, it, my jaw dropped and I just, I was like, yeah, that's, that's an Amiga. Because I'd seen an Atari ST before and I was like, ah, I don't know, I mean... I'm sure the MSX can do that, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, the Amiga was uh, was was just so just uh, yeah it was just in a different league altogether, uh, and uh, so I went home with uh, that demo disc actually of uh, Shadow of the Beast, which is actually just uh, the the scroller and the title Shadow of the Shadow of the Beast. That's all it had. You couldn't play the game, but I just I, I had it running and just watching that for about a couple of weeks until I got my first game from my friend um, well Andrew's that. about to lower the tone with the next question by using the other A word so go ahead Andrew yes and that's because of course the Atari is often considered the musician's it, it choice is. on account of its MIDI ports so uh, why didn't you choose that? I I don't know actually I nearly did um, 
did Harry actually had made a, a huge impact on me because it was 89 we went to Berlin as a school trip and that's when the the wall the Berlin wall actually um, fell uh, so it was actually exactly at that time while we were there it happened so I have memories of Berlin as a, as a teenager just up on the wall with a hammer and a chisel literally cutting out bits of the wall but the family I was staying in was um, the family uh, the neighbor of the family I, I was staying with sorry had uh, an Atari ST and uh, through discussion I don't know how we came to that because I really couldn't speak German and they had no French uh, but um, I think we did it through English but uh, they ended up telling me that their neighbor's kid had a computer so I was like well I gotta see that because again start for any content you know it's just if you knew somebody that had a computer or a console you had to see it <laughs> so I went over and he, what it was it was an Atari ST so I spent the whole evening just playing uh, a few games on the Atari ST and he had it hooked up to his uh, uh, audio system and uh the first, the first, the very first uh, uh, tune that uh, he played was the uh, the Speedball 2 track uh, on a big stereo, and uh, I was like, "Oh my God, this is uh, this is another level," you know. Um, I, I I never because I was used to the PSG, the MSX PSG. There was no sound synthesis or anything like that, and suddenly to hear those sampled uh, samples and 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 a different quality of a, of a, of sound chip was just it was just amazing. Yeah, why didn't I pick an, an Atari ST? Because all my friends, well, my other friend had an Amiga, and then another kid in the village ended up buying an Amiga as well. So I was like, well, I, I've, <laughs> I've already done that part, you know, having a computer that nobody has. I've, I've done that for about, you know, five, six years. <laughs> How about I start fitting in? Uh, but it was seeing the Shadow of the Beast run on the Amiga. It just sealed the deal. And so um, did you then go on to create music with your Amiga? That was one of the first thing I did. Yeah, I was like, okay, I need to find out what what um, softwares I can use to make music. Again, I was just making stuff with Basic first, and I discovered I can't remember how. I think it was a, a, a floppy in a in a magazine that had a sound tracker. So I started using that straight away, and I uh, I found a little in the magazine was a, an ad for one of those little catalog you could uh, you could order to get you know extra demos or you know demo to purchase demo discs and that kind did of stuff did you ever go as far as getting yourself a sampler to pop in the back of the amiga i have one here <laughs> i have my old sampler <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, what i used to do it came with a software it was really cool because it came with a software that would actually when you reboot the amiga it actually um uh, reads the ram so you could actually see the RAM as a sound wave. So I would rip all the samples from games and demos like that, uh, unless they specified that the RAM needs to be refreshed. Um, but, uh, um, so I would rip all the uh, all the samples. And it was just a, a, a long, long sound wave of, of the RAM, so you had to listen to a lot of just static noise and random noise. So it was like... Blink, blink, blink. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was really cool, but it was a... Uh, the sam- a software that came with the sampler, uh, and we uh, we recorded uh, our voices on that little thing as well, way too many times to scare our parents. So please tell us about your next choice of song. My next track is the uh, Sign of the Worm, a track from uh, the game Dune. Now that's uh, that's not specifically an Amiga game. It was also released on PC, but I, I first I first played it on the Amiga, and. Uh, I remember this game very well for well for a couple of reasons, but uh, I first played it on the Amiga and just I was I was I was just sucked into it. That was the first time that I literally, I mean every other game I just played casually every now and then. Uh, that was the first time I would spend an entire evening and then the next evening and I spent a week on that game just just trying to finish it because it was just so it was just so epic and amazing. Uh, and at the time I didn't know about Dune the film or the uh, the novel um, so I was just captivated by the the world uh, in the game and the, and the soundtrack which is again so so evocative and absolutely amazing and I'd never quite heard anything like that either it was just a mix of genres of, of Arabic influence and Jewish influence and, and uh, there was some uh, obviously obviously a lot of uh, um, 
synth uh, synthesis and, and things like that. It was sort of a mix of Jean-Michel Jarre and, you know, um, I, I grew up in, a, in an area of France that had a lot of uh, people from Tunisia and Morocco, so the oud and different flutes. I was used to the, those sounds as well, but to hear them coming out of my computer was just absolutely fantastic and uh, and then I went I think that very same year I went on holidays to my dad's house and uh, and he had bought a PC and with it he had uh, copies of Dune uh, on uh, on floppies so I replayed Dune uh, with an ad-lib sound card on uh, on his PC um, with obviously you know to enhance or different sounds I'm not sure which one I prefer actually uh, graphics were definitely better but it was just uh, I, so I replayed that game again at my dad's uh, on a PC so I played it twice in less than a year on two different platforms and then I found out that there's a film um, Dune and that's adapted uh, an adaptation of the novel Dune so I start reading the first book and I am stuck. I am stuck in that novel. I cannot. Uh, I cannot get out of it. Uh, and I finish it, and clearly, it's not the end. There's something else afterwards. So there's a second book I need to buy. And I ended up in that year just reading the entire series of Dune. And I've become a fan of Dune ever since, uh, because because it's it's amazing to the point that I've I've read the main the main series that Frank Herbert uh, wrote about four times and I, I've read the, uh, the the stuff that his, uh, his son or his grandson wrote as well about twice each so I love Dune I love anything dude and I love the music more of a, a point and click adventure game and it was a, a slower pace than your previous choices and it was complemented by very atmospheric music. Do you feel we had to wait for the 16-bit era to achieve atmosphere through music in games or do you think it was possible with the limited capabilities of the 8-bit computers? Yeah, that's a very good question. So there, there's a game on the MSX called The Treasure of Ushas. That's an MSX2 game. Um, and so it was a Konami game. It came out after Vampire Killer and after they had introduced the SCC chip to the gaming. But it had so, it, but it just had a PSG track. It was just three tracks, just uh, just playing the PSG. Um, the Yamaha was it A Y. Eight, nine, ten, or something like that. Um, but those tracks are incredibly, incredibly atmospheric, and I would encourage you to listen to um, um, to them. Uh, maybe, maybe not the first level, but the other level was definitely, definitely incredibly haunting and, and just uh, beautifully crafted. And it's hard to believe that it's actually coming out of a three-channel uh, PSG. So yes, I think it, it was possible, but it came out very, very late. Uh, in the, uh, I think it was the, one of the last Konami games, but so y yes and no. I think it took the 16-bit era and and sampling and uh, uh, to be able to bring tracks that were truly evocative and and could actually bring colors, uh, you know, reference colors that you were familiar with, but uh, uh, hadn't heard before. You know, and, and Dune was very much like that. It was. It was almost familiar, but completely foreign at the same time. Uh, that, that soundtrack was such such a match for the game that Dune was. Um, you spoke there about how the um, the raised limits of the 16-bit micros allowed that atmosphere. Do you think when computers then moved into CD formats and those limitations were pretty much gone entirely... Do you think we lost something along the way there? I think so. Um, I had a very, very interesting conversation um, for uh, on one of the 
podcast that I do on my channel. It was uh, it was actually just this uh, this Sunday with uh, uh, I had a conversation with David Wise, um, who's the uh, composer for the Donkey Kong series, and uh, and we were talking about that era of uh, and actually I had the same conversation with uh, Barry Leach, which I have another podcast with, and he, he done the. Uh, Lotus Turbo Challenge um, to soundtrack, but anyway, um, we're talking about the, the that era was just so creative because of the limitations, and that's exactly what we talked about. It's just the fact that when you have limitations, you have to be creative uh, because you you don't have the luxury of having unlimited tracks or unlimited samplers, you know. The sample rate or whatever uh, so you, you have to work within the confines of those limitations and that forces you to be creative and, and adapt to what the system offers and I definitely think that's that's when we saw creative work at least as it as it's at its best um, but again it's hard to say for for somebody who, who makes music or for or a performer or a composer because for 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 me part of the interest of making those covers is the challenge itself it's the process itself so not the end result so i'm i'm judging i'm judging the end result from a different you know the finished composition we're judging that from a completely different standpoint that somebody who just hears it and and hasn't taken part in the process I'm not sure if i'm making sense here but it's uh, as 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 a as a musician yes the limitations were definitely one of the uh, most interesting <laughs> parts actually of making music then i suppose it, it does like i think uh, you know one of the points i guess neil was trying to touch on as well and neil you can correct me if i'm wrong was that it almost felt when you had these cds with uh, arranged pieces of music and some good quality and some pretty lazy that uh, it, al- it almost lost something and that the music wasn't able to adapt with the gameplay so it's so neatly That's- Maybe, yeah, maybe just some of that. I think also, you heard uh, you, when you heard a track that was done on the Amstrad, you knew it was from the Amstrad. If it was coming from the Spectrum, you knew it was from the Spectrum. It's, again, from the Nintendo chip is so recognizable, you know, and the Sega chip as well. So those tracks, even the sound itself, had personality and a color already that you could identify, and it gave. It gave the, the the tune that character, uh, and I think when you move to CD format and you move to overly produced uh, 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 tracks uh, that don't rely on the sound chip, then you start losing that character because it can be pretty much anything you want it to be, which is I suppose great for a composer point of view. Or, but I think it the track as a whole loses the character because it's not associated with a platform anymore. I suppose it's like listening to an audio tape while you're playing the game, or similar to having pre-rendered 3D graphics in a 2D game, isn't it? It's kind of, ah, it's not right. <laughs> yes, yeah, something like that. We did, that, that audio tape uh, analogy is funny, because we did that, my friend had an Amstrad uh, uh, CPC, the, the 6128, and uh, he, we had, uh, what well, he had, outrun on it, but with it came the audio tape of the game uh, that you could play as you were playing, and... Uh, that made the game probably 100% better than it actually was because you were playing to the original track. I remember that, actually. Yeah, I, I had the very same on my on my CPC 464. It came with the separate tape, so I would put it in my dad's stereo next to the computer <laughs> and it would just play the arcade music. And yeah, that is one example where it worked very well. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, we talked about the limitations there of the system and what you could and couldn't do with it. And one way of really testing the limitations of a machine, especially in the 16-bit era with the Amiga we saw a lot of, was those mega demos. And your next choice is from that scene. So why don't you tell us what you've chosen? Uh, my, yeah, my next choice is from uh, an, a mega demo. Uh, was it a, a Razor? A mega demo, I think, uh, called uh, Voyage, and uh, uh, it's not actually the the initial track, but it's uh, it's halfway through the demo. The, this track that comes up that is very much a space odyssey type of epic done on the. It it sounds very synth like and. Uh, uh, and it is done like that. I find out afterwards because I got the uh, the I, I did actually get my hands on the mod uh, to find out how it was done, and not only is it just a super epic. Uh, track, but also it actually 
it changed the way I used. Uh, I was, I think, I was using Pro Tracker at the time. So after Sound Tracker, I started using Pro Tracker, and then I moved to Octomed. But it actually uh, introduced me to a lot of tricks and techniques in uh, Pro Tracker uh, to get, you know, different. Uh, well, to get chords done and uh, just how to approach melodies and how to get echo and that kind of stuff. So it's a very technical track, and it introduced me to a, a lot of. Uh, uh, technicalities that I, I didn't know were available on the, on something like Pro Tracker because again I mean my English was limited at the time it probably still is and uh, I I didn't have access to a, a manual you know so uh, so yeah and and it's it's an incredibly good track uh, Overload I think it was called. So for me, the demo scene really was one of my favourite facets of 16-bit ownership over what my console-owning friends could do. And there's a huge choice of great demos from the Amiga. The one you chose was released in 1991 by that Razer group. It must have been hard to pick one demo out of the many available. So were there any others on your short list that you can think of? Oh, for sure. Um, it was a, a Enigma. They had a mega demo as well that had... Uh, uh, how do I describe it? Uh, it was done anything, basically anything done by Mantronics or Tip. Uh, you know, um, these were my demo gods. Uh, there was the Red Sector Mega demo as well, which I uh, I, I used to watch on repeat. Uh, it had that uh, Iron Maiden type character with a match as the uh, as the main loader, and uh, and it was actually the first Mega demo I I, I used to uh, uh, I had. Um, I don't know, it, it, it was so ubiquitous as well, because let's be honest, I didn't have a lot of original games, so a lot of the games I had uh, were cracked, you know, they were just uh, hired versions, and uh, before the game usually came a little uh, a little demo and a little, uh, they, were, they were called trainers, weren't they? Um, a cheat codes essentially for your game so you could have uh, unlimited lives but they were actually really well done usually you had uh, some t technical coding just to, to display a few graphics and or moving bits on screen and and that was all very very technical and uh, you had uh, you the music um, so I was introduced to a lot of these uh, demo groups from that and then find out afterwards that there was a uh, mega demos it's hard, it's really hard to pick um, yeah, anything. Mo uh, there was a guy as well called Moby. Uh, no relation to that um, Moby character that came out afterwards, but uh, I think he was a French musician and he, he did a lot of uh, music as well on the media. Yeah. Um, yeah, just this weekend, um, Andrew and some other friends were in the cave here, and we were having a rave up to Jesus on ease, and we had space balls going as well. <laughs> but uh, on the subject of those trainers and those crack throws. What always made me smile in, in later years was if you ever got hold of a key gen, which, you know, obviously I didn't. I'm just told about these Likewise, things. Likewise, yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> often they would include those old chip tunes from the Cracked Rose, and that would always make me smile that it still sort of lived on 10 or 20 That's years That's right, well, so I've been told, yes, yes. <laughs> 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 were you using your traditional instruments at the same time as well, or were you fully into that tracker music? Um, so I was using trackers a, a lot on the Amiga, and after the MSX, yes, that, that was the first compositions I, uh, I I did on the MSX. I wasn't playing any instruments at the time because I, I had no musical background, but by the time I got my first guitar, uh, when I was, was I 14, I think, uh, I... Uh, I had an understanding of uh, you know triads and and time signatures and because you had to you know um, 
<clears throat> so I had an understanding of s some music elements and uh, getting the guitar was the most disappointing experience of my life um, because <laughs> because I could I see you giggling here I because I, I was on the Amiga and I could compose entire tracks four section parts with um, just well, in my head there were epic epic tunes uh, and now I had an instrument so I couldn't get two notes to play together and uh, it was so so disappointing um, so no I wasn't <laughs> using <laughs> traditional instruments uh, then um, it took me a while to warm to the guitar actually so this next track Ollie um, is not the first time we've heard it today because you very kindly have let us use it as the theme tune for our podcast and I don't think there could have been a more perfect choice so why don't you go ahead and introduce the theme tune to Desert Island Diskettes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is uh, the uh, out front uh, passing breeze uh, theme. And uh, I, I, I love the Outrun series. We've talked about arcades early on, and, and Outrun was certainly one of those games that I, I loved um, and uh, couldn't live without. But uh, no, it was, I just have a memory of, uh, of hearing that very tune for the first time. So I mentioned my parents were separated, and uh, I used to go with my dad in summer. Um, my dad had a boat in Brittany, so we'd spend July and August on the boat um, just cruising around Brittany and we'd go to uh, Jersey and Guernsey a lot uh, and I love Jersey and Guernsey because it had all these arcade halls and, and toys shops and you know and it was different um, so I, I, I loved it but I remember we were I think we were uh, just waiting to get into the main the marina in, in uh, it was Guernsey I think uh, so we were uh, on the mooring and I could hear, I could hear an arcade somewhere. I could hear an arcade somewhere. I could hear the sounds of Pac-Man or Galaga or just every now and then when the wind was turning right. But out of that noise came what I believe, because I can't verify it for sure, but what I believe was out from passing breeze. Um, because, and, I, and then I was like, where is that coming from? Is that coming from the arcade? And I just agonized for, for a whole day until the next day where I could actually go and check it out. What, what that music was, because I'd never heard it, was it an actual game? And if it is, my God, what, what does it look like? Because the, the music is just a full piece, you know? Um, what arcade game could possibly be playing that? And uh, it, was, it was such an exciting moment and incredibly frustrating because I couldn't get to it. Uh, so I think that, that was my first introduction to Passing Breeze and, and Outrun. And then I discovered the game and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was just so um, incredibly beautiful and, and that whatever the technique they, they, it's called, I forget now, but that, that 3D scrolling or... Super scalar. <laughs> super scalar, that is. Uh, that super scalar um, uh, effect was just absolutely amazing. It's the first time I'd seen that. The, 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 the cars look, almost looked like they were in 3D because the, the sprites were so well done and the, from, you could see them from different angles. It was just amazing. But the music, the music was... was was what actually frustrated me and made me discover Outrun, Outrun from a, a few hundred yards away uh, I was stuck on the boat and uh, I loved it after that and to the point that I actually got my own Outrun machine at home now so... I'm a huge fan of Outrun myself and, and all the music, right down to even even the noise it makes when you put a credit in the machine. Yeah, yeah. And even you don't mind when the game's over, thanks to that game over music. Ex when you put yeah, your, exactly. your initials in the high score, it's just, it's just brilliant. 
And there's no cooler feeling, I think, than sitting in an outrun cabinet, in my mind. Um, I had the pleasure of playing one this year at the Play Expo in Blackpool. And um, other than Passing Breeze, are there any other tracks from Outrun that you've covered? Have you covered all of them? Um, I haven't covered all of them. Well, from the main game, there's only three. There's uh, there's, uh, um, Passing Breeze. You're going to have to help me for the other ones because I'm drawing a blank right now. Um, uh, Magical Sound Shower. I'm I'm just picturing the guy's hand on the stereo when you choose the track. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> is it Splash Wave? Is and one? Splash Wave. So I've done, yeah, yeah I've done Splash Wave. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, Magical Sound Shower is the, the last one I need to do, really. I'm not sure about the uh, the end credits um, tune, if if I will cover that at some point, but I, I definitely want to do a, to do the third one. Um, and it's it's because now, like I said, I, I have the arcade machine, and it's in uh, it's in my head. <laughs> it's in my head all the time because I I play it still quite a lot. Uh, yeah, absolutely love love Outrun. Uh, and that arcade actually machine I have was made in Ireland, um, of all places. Uh, there was a factory in Tipperary, in the south of Ireland, that uh, an Atari factory that made uh, Atari cabs, obviously, but they also licensed at the end of their their life they licensed uh, uh, um, their manufacturing um, to Sega so they made a lot of Outrun well they made a lot of Sega cabs and that Outrun actually was made in Ireland it ended up in the Isle of Man for a while and then I got it back here nice and you've mentioned that you own the Outrun cabinet talk us through which other cabinets you've got there Ollie so I have a Galaga I have a Double Dragon uh, I have uh, Arkanoid the Arkanoid is actually a it was a Dig Dug cabinet uh, that was converted to Arkanoid because Arkanoid only came in a conversion kit. There was no dedicated cabs for it, um, and so it's kind of cool because I, I have two cabs in one, uh, <laughs> and then I have uh, I have a, a Donkey Kong a cabaret version, it's the mini version, uh, which I actually made from scratch. Um, I that, and I just finished restoring a Pac-Man cabaret. Um, that one looked like it needed a lot of work doing to it. Oh, it did, yeah. The, yeah. Even the, the wood was all you know, chewed up at the bottom. It's the problem with those uh, that very model, actually. The, the, it, it, they use that chip wood, so um, it, it got a, most of them got water damaged at some point. So I had to repair a lot of that. I had to, I had to fix everything. Even the monitor was, uh, was fried on it, so I had to recap it all. And I, I think I know what your answer is going to be, but what's your stance on the CRT versus the, the flat screen monitors in, in Oh, RP? flat screen all the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously CRT um, for me. I, I get it. I mean, not everybody can fix CRTs, you know, and, uh, uh, or has the time to fix them. And uh, the, the LCDs are certainly a, 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 an easy option if you, if you don't, you know, it's terrifying to some people. So I, I can't be mad at, at people who just put a, an LCD. Um, I, I'm mad if you throw the CRT in the bin and and, and break it. But um, yeah, so whatever works at the end of the day, you know. It's yeah, those games are meant to enjoy one way or another. So if you enjoy them on an LCD or a CRT, it doesn't really matter. So Ollie, when it comes to the video game music that you cover on your channel, do you ever take requests? Or are you are you influenced by the comments at all? Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 very much. I do I do consider suggestions, and and I have done before. Um, I have a list. I have a huge, huge list of tunes I want to cover. If I if I continue at that pace, which is a tune every uh, a track every two weeks, and then I have a not a video in between, but a, a track a cover every two weeks, I'm going to be busy for seven years. Um, so I have quite a, <laughs> a long list of stuff, and uh, and and uh, last year I didn't touch the list at all because uh, it was just stuff that came up. I, I remembered suddenly that weren't in the list or suggestion that people had made. So I never promise anything. I never say, you know I never say send me your suggestions and I'll I'll do them. It's just uh, I do check everything though. I, I I consider everything and if it's suitable, I go. Yeah, I, I'll do it. And then if the tune gets stuck in my head to the point that I, I can't get rid of it other than covering it, then yeah, I, I, I bump it up. <laughs> so Neil, are you, are you, are you thinking of uh, using what minor influence you may have in this uh, 
podcast to make a suggestion to Ollie? What would it? What would I it be? I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare. There's, yeah, there's, yeah. No, no. There's so much of Ollie's back catalogue that I need to work through. To be honest, I'm, I'm more than happy with what's available. How about you, Andrew? <laughs> what would you like to hear? Maybe like a, a smooth lounge version of the Paperboy theme or something like that. Actually, that is a bloody good <laughs> idea. I hadn't thought of that. that that's, uh, that's your idea, Neil. So that's your one in, in the bag, <laughs> surreptitiously. Um, actually, I really love um, the SNES era and F Zero, but I already know Ollie that you have done a cover of um, Big Blue, so I'm pretty happy. I'm already it's there. A blinding cover. Yeah, it really is. I, I want to do more actually from F Zero as well, um, but yeah, it, it's it's in my list. <laughs> so we'll be we'll be eagerly waiting, watching for your videos just to see if it's that that one that we wanted. What, what's interesting is I, I started in, in some cases redoing some of the earliest covers that I've done because uh, I wasn't entirely happy with what I'd, I'd done or I knew I could do a better version. Uh, F-Zero is actually in one I would like to redo with a, a bigger bigger sound because um, I'm just using the banjo and mandolin and I know I can use the bass and, uh, and the accompaniment chords and a, a proper or nicer drums on it. So. It's one I, I've been thinking about redoing, actually. Well, Ollie, banjo guy, Ollie, before we sail away and officially cast you away onto Retro Island, never to be seen again, um, and ask you your two final questions, why don't you let the listeners know how they can find you? Because I know it's not just YouTube that uh, is an outlet. Yeah, it's, it's banjo guy only on YouTube, and I'm um, also under the same name in Twitter and uh, and Facebook and Instagram. Um, I'm everywhere, man. <laughs> okay so you have two more decisions to make uh, i'll ask the first one which is if you can only take one of the eight tracks you've talked about today to keep you company which one would it be dune <laughs> <laughs> didn't even have to think about it yeah yeah i love dune it, yeah I, again for those reasons i i, I talked about it and it's so evocative and uh, incredibly well crafted and then it, it would remind me of the game and the novels and and then so much yeah dune and, and because we're very, very generous here, we'll give you a bonus gamer application that you can take with you. However, it can't have any online capabilities. So what would that be? God, that's a tough one. Um, I, I'm going to go with Dune again. Actually. <laughs> yes. Love, love for Dune. <laughs> <laughs> Not even Dune 2, just Dune. <laughs> Dune, yeah, Dune, Dune 2 is cool. It's just, I love Dune so, so much because it was so close to the uh, the story and the uh, the the original book is uh, if anything does a good tribute it certainly is the uh, the video game dune um and it's long enough to you know to be enjoyable for how long i'm stuck on the island <laughs> hopefully i'll get rescued soon so actually ollie we've cheated you in some respects because we've given you the you've got the game with the soundtrack and the, you've got the track <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us, Ollie. It's been a pleasure having you, of all people, as our very first guest, and hopefully the first of many. Well, thank you, thank you very much for inviting me on the, on, on this desert island. Um, it was it was yeah, it was a blast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening, and we hope you'll join us on the next Desert Island Discettes.